bless you as you're seated. We thank God for you. As you're just leaning back in your seat, would you just throw your hands up to God now and begin to tell him how much he means to you. I love you, Jesus. I love you so much. I appreciate you, Father. I love you. I love you. I, I love you. I love you, Father. I love you. I adore you. Father, we, we, we give you praise. We, we give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise because you're God. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Father, we worship you. Hallelujah. We magnify you right now, Lord Jesus. You have been so kind and so good. Hallelujah. 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 Reach over and grab somebody by the hand right now. And we're, you're praying for that person that you have by the hand. You're praying for their physical strength. That God would strengthen them in their bodies, strengthen their minds, their emotions, that they may hear the word of the Lord. Strengthen right now, Father, those that are tired, those that are weary, bring a refreshing, that they may hear what the Spirit has to say to the church. We thank you for it right now. We bring edification. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Father, we, we worship you. We, we praise you. We adore you. Let it flow from hand to hand, from heart to heart. Father, let strength. He come about. Let power flow down the line. Let power. Let power begin to flow down the line. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Hallelujah. My God, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thou art worthy, thou art worthy, thou, thou art worthy, O Lord. Praise God, praise God. Turn and tell somebody, thank you for praying for me. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good when we pray for each other. It's good when we lift up one another in the name of Jesus. I'm in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. And we thank God for what he has done all through this meeting. He has been so gracious and kind unto us. And uh, we want to thank God for Bishop and Sister Francis, we want to appreciate, you see, meetings like this don't happen unless there's men and women of God that have visions and burdens. You can have people in the house that want to do these things, but unless the headship, amen, begins to open the doors and not only uh, allow it to happen, but encourage it to happen, these things don't manifest. Somebody needs to clap your hands and thank God for this man and woman of God. Hallelujah. The Bible said, give honor to whom honor is due. We thank God for them. Amen. And for this singles committee that has done such an excellent job, we thank God for them. And all of you, the people of God that are here. I want to get into the word of the Lord and get into the mind of God where he's standing right now as far as the caliber of people that he's getting ready to raise up. The Lord is not just looking at a people to show up to church, but there is a type of people that God is going to raise up in this last time generation. 
that he shall release great power to. I want to tell you right now, if you only praise and worship when you minister, and then when you sit, you don't praise, you just watch everybody, you can't have this power. This power belongs to full-time praisers, full-time worshipers. This power belongs to people that are going to plug into God and recognize that they are dependent solely on the Lord. And I want you to see in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Uh, we're going to begin in verse 8. We're familiar with the upper portion of Isaiah Six, we know the story. He's seen the Lord high and lifted up, and uh, he realizes he's unclean. A seraphim comes, touches him on his lips, and purges him. Then we now look, amen, at verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I. Send me. Anybody in here ready to tell God, send me? Send me, Lord. Send me. Use me, send me. But I want you to catch this now, verse 9. The Lord speaks back to his response of send me. And he said, go tell this people. Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people that. He's not talking about the world now. He's talking about the church. He said, preach to them until their hearts are fat with my word. Make their ears heavy, shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and convert and be healed. Do you know what God was telling this prophet? God was telling the prophet, I want you to go and preach, but the people aren't going to hear you. And even though you're saying what I want you to say, they will not, my people will not hear you. Hear the prophet's response to this. Verse 11. Then said I, Lord, how? I want to tell you one reason why we're struggling, Bishop. Because we all want to see the results. I want to know that if I preach, you're affected. I want to know if I'm praying for somebody, they're moved. I want to know if I'm sowing money into something, it's productive. But God doesn't operate like that. He said, preach to a people that are not going to listen to you. He asked, how long do I have to do this? How long do I have to preach without productivity? How long do I have to sow and not reap? How long do I have to go in church and pray and not see anything happen? How long? Listen to God's response. And he answered, until the cities be wasted without inhabitants, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly destroyed. He said, preach until I destroy them. Preach until I get ready to remove them. Until I'm not ready to remove them, you just keep preaching and don't look for any results. Don't y'all lose your shout on me. I want to speak to you tonight on this subject, the obedience of the prophets. The obedience of of the prophets. Our motives are wrong. The prophets moved simply because God said so. Their reward was not the results. Their reward was obeying him. Their reward was that they pleased him. The reward was not that people were converted. The reward was not that people were healed. The reward was not that people were saved. The reward was that they could stand flat-footed and say, I have obeyed thy voice. That was their reward. That's what they lived to do. And whether anybody held up their hands and said that was good, they didn't get amens, you understand? People weren't waving them on and cheering them on. They preached to a people that did not want to listen to them. This was not the world. This was the church. Where did you get your motivation from? Because I love him. Why do you do this? Because I love him. How come you open up your mouth and proclaim this? Because I love him. But nobody's responding to you. It doesn't matter. I love him. This is what he asked from me. I will obey him. I 
Why we are struggling is we only want to jump on something that is moving. And that is awesome what happened at General Conference. This is awesome. To me, what is so awesome about General Conference is the fact that it is a major move in Canada. Canada has never known a revival. This is the first revival of any kind in the country of Canada. This is a land, it was a landmark conference. The God busted through satanic strongholds, a place in Ontario where they're legalizing same-sex marriages. God broke through and let the Holy Ghost run loose. That's wonderful. That's powerful. That's great. We can shout about it. But I want to tell you the caliber of people that God's going to raise up. It's the caliber of people that will look steadfast and plant their feet in the ground and say, I shall not be moved. And whether you like what I'm doing or not, if I am sent by God, if I am authorized by God, that is all that I need. An organization may not agree. You may not agree. But if God said this is what it is, this is what I shall do. God's going to raise up people that are going to look at him and say, I will obey you. Somebody lift your hands and say, I will obey you. Here comes the key to obedience. It must be done with joy. God says, I love a cheerful giver. No, I don't love a giver. You can clean the church up. That does not impress God. You can give the largest of the offering of anybody that gives it. That does not impress God. God's not broke. You can give the most food in church. That doesn't impress God. What impress God is your attitude and your giving. God said it has to be cheerful or it is unacceptable. That word cheerful means hilarious, exuberant, excited. If you play an instrument, cheerful. Look like you've been baptized in lemon juice. Cheerful. Unacceptable. Your playing's in vain. Because it's supposed to be an act of love, not of tolerance and not of duty. God's going to raise up caliber of people. You hear me now. I'm telling you why we're struggling. I'm telling you why we're struggling. We're struggling because we're so used to getting from God until we're not used to God being our Lord. And when you deal with the Lord, you're dealing with somebody that's going to tell you what they want. And you say, yes, sir. Not why. Not how come. Not I'm not in the mood. Not this is not what I wanted. But yes. You know, we sang that song, Sister Francis led us in that song this morning. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. You know, we, we get so used to singing these songs. Till every now and again, God's got to check us. We used to sing a song, I'm yours, Lord. Everything I am, everything I've got, I'm yours, Lord. Try me now. As soon as you go outside and your tire is flat. For God, I pray, I give my tithes. Why do you let this happen to me? Try me now. We've gotten so used to singing these songs until we don't do what we're singing. We got we gotten so professional at quoting scriptures till we don't do them. We quote enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. You ever see the saints come in? The praise doesn't start till the song leader begins. There's something that when you tuck praise away in your heart and you walk into the house of God armed and dangerous because the praise is already in your spirit. I don't wait for a song leader. I don't wait for somebody to get up and say, clap your hands. I don't wait for somebody to say, stand up on your feet. There's a praise that's been in my system all day long from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. I woke up with my, this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. I woke up with the praise I go to bed with the praise I don't wait for church to start the praise these prophets were men in caliber I want you to understand something by the word of the Lord the word worship one of the definitions for the word worship means to serve this is why the Bible says serve the Lord with gladness Worship to serve. 
When God asks you to do something for him, that is worship. And it must be done with joy or it is unacceptable. So God asks you to lead a song service. God asks you to witness. God asks you to testify. God asks you to do something. Asks you to get up in the middle of the night and pray. God is looking for worship. Everybody say worship. Worship comes from the English word worth or to set value on. God knows how much you love him by how you worship or put worth, value on. God determines your love by the placing of your value. And your value is determined by your deeds and the motive in which you perform them. So when God says, if I am worthy, then I look for you to act in accordance to me being worthy. That's why God can ask you to do some things you don't want to do. And God said, I want to know how much I am worth to you. Are your feelings worth more to you than me? Are the things about you don't like, is that worth more to you than me? Or can you push that down and prioritize and say, you mean more to me than my comfort zone. Therefore, I will bless you. I will worship you by serving you the way you ask me to. Somebody say, I'll worship you, Lord. I want you to follow me. I want you to follow me be because we need to go through some portions of scripture. Turn to the book of Jeremiah. We're dealing with the obedience of the prophets. And I just want to go, amen, to Jeremiah. And I want to look at the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 20. Now, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how you were raised spiritually to understand certain things in the word of the Lord. But I was raised with the understanding. But when Jeremiah said it was like fire shut up in my bones, he was dealing with the dance, the shout, the praise, the enthusiasm. It was not until God, in his gracious mercy, spoke to me one day and said, would you please read that? That you may know why my prophet was talking about fire shut me because I heard choirs, I heard preachers, I preached it myself. It's like fire shut up my bones and then you know, hey, 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 hey. And, you know, it was a party in the house. We were gone. And but you see, when you look at some things, the perspective starts to change. And when I tell you, if, be, if a great move is going to happen, it's not just because you're excited. A great move is going to happen because you're obedient. The Lord spoke to me some time ago. He said, you're not, you're, he talked to me personally. He said, you're not getting it. He was talking to me. He said, you're not getting it. And a lot of my people aren't getting it. He said, you're praying for revival. And it's my grace that's holding revival back. I said, grace is holding. He said, that's right. He said, do you know what happens when I move and people are not in the right place? Ananias and Sapphira. Because when a move of God starts and people are not founded in the right place, it runs right over them. That was New Testament. Agrippa, King Agrippa, proclaiming himself God. He didn't, he, actually the scripture says he didn't proclaim himself God. The people did. But worms ate him up. Um, when a move of God, people start dying in a move. They start, you, you don't understand. <laughs> you, don't, you don't understand. Some of y'all would walk in here, give your half-hearted little praise, and God would just go, Whoosh. Because God said, I just watched you give more energy to your car, to your house. You clean your house stronger than that. You cook your meal with more vigor than that. And now you want to come give me leftovers. And I'm the one that gave you the strength to begin with. If I didn't give you the strength to clean your house, you couldn't even done that. If I didn't even give you the strength to get up, you couldn't even get your body up. If I didn't give you the strength even to remember the way from your bedroom to your bathroom, you'd be in a mental traffic jam. And now you want to come and give me this half-hearted, indifferent, lackadaisical, limp-wristed, I got angels around the throne 24-7 shouting, holy, holy, holy. Now you want to act like it's a chore to open your mouth? 
I'm not that desperate, saith the Lord. But I will find me a people that will open up their mouth, that will obey me, tired in their bodies, but they'll push beyond their tiredness. They'll push through their pain. They'll push through their discomfort. It's not that they're not weary. It's not that they don't have a busy schedule. They know their priorities. And they know how to open up their mouth and give me my praise. Because some of you, as tired as you are, you're going to get up tomorrow and go to work and give the man his due. And yet now, God said, where, where is my praise? Where is my praise? Where is my praise? My God, if God would just only base our praise on our strength, some of y'all couldn't even lift your finger. He shot by my mother. But I will have an obedient people, saith the Lord. Shekomo, Rebebekata, Ramahashaka, Rebekoto, Hashaman, Rabahas, Yeshandre, Rebekasha, Hekomo, Noseka, Hekoshanda, Ramahasikete. My God. I want you to see the obedience of these prophets. You know, we marvel at these prophets. We marvel at Isaiah because he was an eagle-eyed prophet. He saw down the line of time. But you don't understand that his power came from the degree of his obedience with joy. Everybody wants all this power. We don't want any inconvenience. Look what he said in Jeremiah 20. I want you to get the, the mindset of what Jeremiah was going through at this time. He had prophesied, verse 1, saying what God wanted them to say. Verse 2, then Pasher smote Jeremiah the prophet and put him in stocks. He was imprisoned for speaking what God said. He was slapped for saying what God said. Verse 4, thus saith the Lord, behold, I will make thee a terror to thyself, to all thy friends. He turns around and starts prophesying to Pasha what God is going to do to him. But listen to this. Verse 7. He's in the pit. He's feeling the sting of the smack. The prophet starts to struggle. Oh Lord, thou hast deceived me. You look up and sometimes you see people of power and you don't know the struggle behind closed doors. You don't understand how the power was made in secret in the struggle of their own minds. You don't know the nights they laid on pillows and soaked them and screamed. You don't know the times in hotel rooms where there was no difference between a hotel room and a prison and you're locked up with God and you're saying why? And you know the answer he gives you? Because if you're going to be like me, then you're going to have to be spent for my people. You're locked up right now so my people can get free later. You're struggling in torment right now so my people can have peace later. You're crying now so that my people can have joy later. But we have too many. You want power for fame. You want power so you can get what you want. Power is not for you. It is to be channeled through you. You are a hose. Yes, the hose gets wet, but the water is not all for the hose. It's meant to channel through you and go out to bear, oh God, to saturate somebody else. And yet even after you've saturated them, you don't always see the fruit. I want you to see this. I want you to hear this. Hear me now. He says, oh Lord, thou hast deceived me. I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I. And as in thou hast prevailed. If I could fight back, I would. But I'm not as strong as you. I don't have what it takes to overcome God. You are more powerful than I. You are stronger than me. Listen to what he says. He said, I am in derision daily. Everyone mocketh me. 
My God, I tell you what, if someone even just so much as laughs at us when we testify, we make a vow we will never testify ever again. Somebody doesn't shake our hands coming through the door. If the pastor or the leadership doesn't acknowledge us, we make a vow we're never coming back to this church ever again. He said, every day I'm being mocked. He said, I've had it. I'm tired. If you don't believe that, then listen to verse 8. For since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil because of the word of the Lord. I said what you wanted me to say. I wasn't doing my own thing. He said, this is what is getting me. I'm being made a reproach. Derision, derision, confusion. I'm in confusion daily. I'm struggling. I'm fighting. Internally, I'm trying. But listen. <laughs> then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak more in his name. This thing got so much underneath me that I made up my mind I was never going to say anything more about God. I, I, this thing was so troubling me. I've been going through it day after day after day. I've been mocked. I was laughed at. I was in confusion. I am not opening up my mouth, he said, anymore. Maybe you don't understand that. Maybe you don't just don't understand that. Maybe you don't understand that. Maybe you don't know what it is to get to the point with God, to look God in the face and say, it's not that I don't want to obey you. It's not that I don't want to serve you. But I can't take much more of this. I'm not saying anything else. I'm staying quiet. It's safer that way. You understand? I'm not going to get hurt that way. You understand? I can put up a wall and finally find some refuge from my own emotions. But listen to the prophet. But his words was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. He's not talking about rejoicing. He's not talking about dancing and shouting. What he's trying to say is the word of God was so strong in him that even when he wanted to shut up and, and not say what God wanted to say, the word was a fire. The word burned him. Do you have that much word in you that when you don't even feel like opening up your mouth to praise God, the word burns you until the praise must come out. This was the obedience of the prophets. This is why they had power with God. This is why they saw the things of God. This is why they knew him. Would you lift your hands to God right now? Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh God, Maya Sama Mahasha, Yemememe Shika Mama Mahasha, Mosoko Mama Mohoshe. Jeremiah, I want you to preach to people that aren't listening. He was getting hit. Where was the fruit? Hey, where was the fruit? You know why some of you are so struggling? Because you're so focused on the fruit that you're not focused on he that sent you. And when you don't see no fruit, you want to give up. It's not about the fruit, honey. It's about him. I do this because he said so. And I do this because I love him. And I do this because he's the joy. You understand? He's my reward. God told Abraham, I am your exceeding great reward. Not souls, not souls, not souls, not souls. I am your exceeding great reward. I am, I am, I am, I am. When I reveal things to you about myself, I am. There's nothing better. There's nothing finer. Listen to the song of Solomon. He's altogether lovely. He's the fairest amongst 10,000. There's nobody like him. Nobody beside him. There's nobody that can equal him. Who will you liken unto our God? You He's the reward, not souls.
I know this is contrary to some of y'all's theology, but you check out Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. He said, for by their fruit they shall know them. He goes on down. He said, listen, in the last days, people are going to come to me and say, Lord, Lord, did not we do many wonderful works in your name? Did not we cast out devils in your name? Did not we heal the sick in your name? He does not call them liars. He simply says, listen to this, depart from me. You are workers of iniquity. I never knew. We didn't have intimate relationship. You used my power. You used my authority. You performed many wonderful works. You even brought in many souls. I don't know you. I don't know you. Get away from me. I don't know you. Some of you are going to be really surprised. You're going to be really surprised. I don't know you. Oh, God. Because God said, I'm looking for some obedient folk. I'm looking for some folk that you're not just simply trying to do what you want to do and claim you're doing what I want you to do. I'm looking for some people, some people that are going to come out your comfort zone. You've got to come out from your own defenses. You've got to come out from your own walls and let me become your shield. Let me become your defense. Stop protecting yourself. Claiming that I'm the one that's telling you to do it. The prophet, the reason for the fire. Is there anybody that's got enough word in you that, that you got a fire? The word is a fire? The word is a, my God, the word is a fire. <sighs> do you understand the prophet sitting there all by himself? You understand? Somebody's not patting in the back. Come on. Come on. The word burned him. The word. The word stirred him up. The word. The word of God. The word of God made him open up his mouth. The word. The word. The word. The word. He even says, I tried to forbear. I tried to hold it back. He said, but I couldn't stay. Woo Do you know what it's like to be in your shower? And maybe you're not what they call a preacher, but the word. Before you know it, you're grabbing a bar of soap and preaching and... The word, the word, the word, the word, that something's in your spirit, the word. I want you to see some of these other prophets because I was looking at this, Bishop, this, this is just, this is astounding, some of these things. You know, we look over these prophets and we see that Jeremiah was the weeping prophet and what he endured as far as the things that he saw with God. We see Isaiah, the visions that he saw all the way down through the line of time. Isaiah, they call it, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, a micro Bible because there's 66 chapters in the book of Isaiah. There are 66 books in the Bible. Isaiah is the book of salvation. And, and, and we, we marvel at Isaiah. We marvel at Ezekiel. Ezekiel, sing the graveyard, and all of these things. But we don't seem to get what it took to get these men where they were. We just want all the same thing they had and don't want to pay anywhere near. Anywhere near. You know, in fact, we think it's bondage if God asks us to do something. Slavery. It's, it's, it's just not right, you know. I want you to see this. Ezekiel chapter 4. You've got to read this carefully with me. Because I want you to see what kind of people God's raising up. I want you to see what kind of people God's raising up. He's going to raise up people that are coming out of their comfort zones. He's going to raise up people whose ambition is not to get a new car and a new house and, and new clothes and get this and get that and all these material things. It's not that God has anything against material things. God will bless you with material things. But he's going to raise up people that that is not their priority. The mere material things do not possess them. They possess the material things, and they can give it away anytime, any place, anywhere that God asks them to give it away. To fund the work of God and to fund the plan of God. Ezekiel chapter 4, verse 4. Listen to God speaking to the prophet Ezekiel. God says, lie thou also upon thy left side. Everybody say your left side. Listen to this. And lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. You know what? If you're going to be used by God, you're going to have to get used to the fact that God is going to lay other people's sin on you. Okay, isn't that what Jesus did? You say, well, what do you mean by that? I mean that sometimes what's literally going to happen is God's going to have you up crying and interceding. God's going to have you taking on the burden of their wrong 
as if you did the wrong. Crying out for them, interceding that they might live. Well, you don't understand, God. I got, I got too many needs to do that. <laughs> Listen to this. He said, lay the iniquity of the house of Israel upon it. According to the number of the days that thou shalt lie upon it, thou shalt bear their iniquity. For I have laid upon thee the years of their iniquity, according to the number of the days, 390 days. So shalt thou bear the iniquity. You know what God said? I want you to lie down on your left side for 390 days. Now, three, you, know, you know the biblical calendar is not the same as our calendar. Our calendar to make a year is 364 and one-fourth days. The biblical calendar was 360 days. So 390 days was an additional 30, which made another month. A year and one month lay on one side. Have you ever tried to lay on one side for eight hours? You know, if God told us that, we'd be, you know, that can't be God. That's crazy. That's, oh, that's ridiculous. I mean, that's, that's, what's, the, what's the, you know why a lot of us struggle? What's, what's the benefit of me doing this? What do I get out of this? What was Ezekiel getting out of this? What was his benefit? What was he getting? I'll tell you what he was getting. His satisfaction was obedience. Because he, you know why a lot of you have difficulty with trials? Well, what am I getting out of this? How is this benefiting me? <laughs> Listen to the prophets. Watch the prophets now. Watch these prophets. Look what he's going through. Listen. He said now, verse 6. And when thou hast accomplished them, once you're done with that, lie again on thy right side. And thou shalt bear the iniquity of the house of Judah 40 days. So now once you're done with your left side for 390 days, switch over now and you can lie on your right side for 40 days. Now you say, well, can he turn back and forth? Let me answer you. Verse 8. And behold, I will lay bands upon thee, and thou shalt not turn thee from one side till another. No, he, no, for the entire eight hours, you lay there. Left side. Don't move. Don't, don't, don't turn on your back. Don't turn to your right side. Stay to one side only. Has any of you ever walked in, worked in a hospital? Do you know what happens with, to people who lay on one side? They get bed sores. That's after a couple of weeks. Not a year and ten days or a year and a month. Do you understand what this was going to do the prophet? Oh, God's not done. <laughs> Oh, my God, if God told any of us this, we'd be crying, crying, flat out, whining, crying. We'd lose all tongues, and we'd go to, ha, ma, 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 ha, ma, ha, ma, 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 ma. But God's not done. <laughs> Watch God. It's going to get better. Touch your neighbor and say, it's going to get better. Oh, well, okay. Uh, verse 11. Thou shalt drink also water by measure, the sixth part of a hen. The sixth part of a hen is about a quart. You may have a quart of water a day. The sixth part of a hen from time to time thou shalt drink. It, by the way, his food was also measured out that he could only eat eight ounces of food a day while doing this. He only could only eat eight ounces of food a day and a quart of water while laying on his side. Oh, what kind of food can I have? Can I at least have something good? Well, let's show you. Verse 12. And thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that come out of a man. You want me to do what, God? I thought you loved me. <laughs> you want me to eat my food out of, with human waste? Uh-huh. Why am I doing this, by the way? Because I'm going to show you that I'm going to make them eat the iniquity of their ways. You mean to tell me I'm going through this because of them? Mm -hmm. Some of you, the thought of it, you're already going, Ugh, don't say any more. I want to keep my dinner down. So you understand how this operated. Human waste in that time could be used as fuel. They would light it. And they'd cook their food on top of it. And the, the waste, what would happen is if you without being too graphically gross. If you've ever put heat to waste material, you know it stinks. The stink
stench of the human waste comes up into the food and now becomes a part of the flavoring of the food. And there's God looking over you going, eat ye all of it. You want to know why Ezekiel could see visions? You want to know why God could pull him up by the hair of his head and take him through walls? You want to know why the man could see down the lines of time? No, we even struggle to give God praise when we're tired. Forget this. Somebody lift your hands a moment and just give God some praise. Don't y'all lose your joy on me. <laughs> Woo! God help us. We need some obedience. Raise up some obedient people. Some folk that are going to obey you with joy. Touch somebody, tell them, I will obey the Lord with joy. Some of y'all having second thoughts after reading this, huh? All right, well, you know what? You know what? I think it's only fair that we see the attitude of the prophet. Let's see what the prophet's response is to all of this. I mean, what did the prophet do? I think I have an idea what a lot of us would do once God would tell us to do this. You know the first thing we do? We would eat like crazy. <laughs> Come on here. We would get the best meal. The If I got to do this, <laughs> I'm at least going to die with a full belly that I like. <laughs> Watch the prophet now. Watch the prophet. He's being told to eat his food with dung. All right? Verse 14. Then said I, our Lord God, behold, my soul hath not been polluted. For from my youth up, even till now, have I not eaten of that which dieth of itself, or is torn in pieces, neither came there any abominable flesh in my mouth. You want to know what the complaint of the prophet is? We don't have time, but in Ezekiel chapter 1, around verse 3, the Bible says that Ezekiel is a priest. The law of the Lord is that the priest cannot eat anything that is dead or torn of itself. You know what he says to God? If I eat that because human waste contains meat, I will be violating your word. Do you, I don't know if you're getting this. Do you understand the mentality of the prophet? He's not thinking, oh, that's nasty, that's gross. All he knows is if I do that, I would only violate you. He's not thinking of himself. He's thinking only that he would violate God. Watch God's response to this. Verse 15, then he said unto me, lo, I have given thee cow's dung for man's dung, and thou shalt prepare thy bread with this. Ezekiel has no more complaint. Ezekiel's cow dung eats the grass. There's no, there's no meat in there. So this doesn't violate the word of the Lord. Ezekiel shuts his mouth. No more complaint. All he was concerned about is, don't let me offend you. Some of you, you're so worried about offending other people. And the God that gives you life and holds your breath, you'd rather offend him by not giving your praise, not giving your worship, not giving your obedience. What he's about here is that he can't even save you, can't deliver you, because you're intimidated by what they might think about you. Somebody lift your hand and say, not me, Lord. Oh, God, don't let it be me. Don't let it be me. I want you to see this. I, I want... Turn with me to Ezekiel. We're going to go just a little bit further. Because I, you just got to see this. Chapter 24 of the book of Ezekiel. Chapter 24 of the book of Ezekiel. All right, God, why am I lying on my side again? Why am I eating, eating food cooked with dung? Oh, you're doing this because my people have sinned. So I've got to eat my food cooked with dung because your people have sinned. That's right. <laughs> Maybe you've never had God keep you up all night long because God's concerned about somebody else. 
Now you got problems stacked up through the roof and God wakes you up and says, hey, I'm concerned about this one or that one. I'm concerned about this or that. And God wakes you up and lays their burden on you and says, hey, I want you to do it with joy, by the way. <laughs> well, Lord, I got to get up and do stuff, you know. And your point is, Because if I don't give you strength, you're not getting up anyways. And if I recall back my breath, you're not going anywhere. So what's your point? <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, if you can't say amen, say ouch. I'll know you're there. I'm in Ezekiel chapter 24. Now listen to this. Listen to this. Listen to this. If, 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 if I know you might be tired, but shake yourself. If you don't stay away from anything else, stay away from this. Just shake yourself. Verse 15, also the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from thee the desire of thine eyes with a stroke. Yet neither shalt thou mourn nor weep, neither shall thy tears run down. Did you get this? God said, I'm going to take away from you the desire of what you want, your desire. I'm going to take it away with a stroke. I don't want you to cry about it. I don't want one tear coming down your eye about it. But what is this desire? Verse 17, forbear to cry, make no mourning for the dead, bind the tires of thy head about thee, put on thy shoes upon thy feet, cover not thy lips, and eat not the bread of men. What are you trying to say? Don't make any kind of mourning for the dead. Why are you telling me this? Verse 18, listen to this. So I spake unto the people in the morning, and at evening my wife died. And I did not in the morning as I was commanded you know what desire he was talking about i'm gonna take your wife from you oh my god most of us backslide at that point you've got to be crazy there's no way i'm serving god and he's gonna take my wife or take my spouse oh and then tell me don't cry not one tear down your eye don't let one tear down your face. Did you hear the prophet? And I, and oh, by the way, after she dies, get up and talk to my people. Strengthen them. And I did, as I was, commanded. <sighs> my God. Somebody lift your hands again and give God, we got to swallow this, I'm telling you. We're crying over a whole lot of stuff that might God help us in this house. <sighs> oh my God. If we lose anything, we lose any loved one, we lose anything. So wrong. <sighs> my God. And I did. As I was commanded. Do you know how to do what's commanded to you? Do you know that praise is a command? Did you know praise is not an option? Did you know praise, touch your neighbor and say praise is a command? Tell them it is not an option. Tell them it's not according to your feelings. And it's not done according to your moods. It is an act of your will. You are commanded to open up your mouth and give God praise. Now, come on, let's do what we were commanded to do. Somebody stand up on your feet just a moment. And I did as I was commanded. Not what I was in the mood for. I did what I was commanded. Samoko. Oh God. Oh God. Oh Teach us to have the obedience. Teach us to obey you. Teach us to obey you with joy. Help us. 
Oh God, help us to stop crying over everything. <sighs> Hallelujah! Hallelujah! God affect parts of this house. Push God through the tiredness. Push through the weariness into the hearts of your people. Raise up an army in Battersea. Raise up warriors in life tabernacle that will obey you. That will praise you. That will come in with a praise. They will do as they're commanded. They will give as they're commanded. <sighs> Pastor Philip, you know what gets me? Pastor Philip, he's a great man of God. I thank God for him. He's a good speaker, but Pastor, you know what gets me? Ezekiel's wife dies. He gets up and talks to the people. You would think God would at least let them get converted after that. There was no conversions. <laughs> there was nobody that changed. Do you know why he was doing that? Because God was telling them, I'm taking you into captivity because of your hardness and your stiffness and you're going to mourn over the loss of your sons and your daughters and you're going to mourn over the loss of your wives and over your husbands. Nobody was getting changed. Such losses. And where is the fruit? We can't imagine throwing on a conference, a single conference, and don't see anybody get touched. Don't see anybody get changed. We would feel like total failures. You hear me? I want to tell you that God's growing us up to another level of maturity. That our privilege, our privilege is that we served him. Our joy is not that somebody was touched. Oh yes, we're always glad when God allows that. But our true joy is that he asked us to serve him. That you actually asked me to do something for you. That is my joy. Whoa! Thank you for allowing me the privilege of doing something for you. He who is all sufficient that needs nobody. He who can lift his hands to heaven and say, I live forever. That you actually would allow me to do something for you. Somebody wave your hands and tell him, thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Ezekiel, how did you see these things? You may be seated. Go to the book of Hosea. Hosea. I want to show you, I've got to show you a few of these prophets because I've got to get you to see this was not just some little incident. In fact, before you go to Hosea, can I go back to Isaiah just a moment? I've just got to show you that these men didn't just do one little incident sometime either. These weren't just isolated things. This was a norm. Isaiah chapter 20. My God, if some of us had to do what Isaiah is getting ready to do, I don't, I don't know if we can make it. Isaiah chapter 20, verse 2. At the same time spake the Lord by Isaiah the son of Amos, saying, Go and loose thy sackcloth from off thy loins, put off thy shoes from thy foot. And he did so, walking naked and barefoot. And the Lord said, Like as my servant Isaiah has walked naked and barefoot for how long? You mean, my God, I don't have to match my tie with my suit, my pocketbook, my, my God. Some of y'all wouldn't know how to act. You don't have to, because some of y'all are so into fashion. 
No clothes for three years. Anything else come from me? It's torment. You mean I can't buy clothes for three years? Good God Almighty. What will y'all some y'all do without shop therapy? <laughs> Naked and barefoot for three years. Just walk around with nothing on. Why are you doing this? For what benefit? What benefit are you getting it? No, it's not for you, Isaiah. It's to show my people what I'm going to do to them. Do you get a com are you getting a common theme? See, the problem why we're not getting revival, you want it for you. Uh -uh. You've got to want it for his people. You've got to want it for his glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You have to want it for his praise. You have to want it because he proclaims that this is what his will is. And you say to him, if this is your will, then it is my joy to do your will. And whether I see fruit from it or not, the Bible said when it speaks about the patriarchs of old, that they died in faith, never receiving the promise. They never saw what they died for. You know who saw it? We have it. That's why the Bible said they without us cannot be made perfect. Why? We have what they died for. Jesus looked at his disciples. He said, you're not getting it. Prophets have desired to see what you've seen. Kings have desired to hear what you have heard. And they never heard it. They died so you could have it. Now you're going to have to die so somebody else can get something. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One more time, worship. I feel the power of God in this house. God is settling a word. I, I'm telling I hear a word from the Lord in this house. We're getting weary too easy. You're getting discouraged too easy. Because you don't see the fruit you want. Oh, God. Oh, Shandara, ba 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 Telling you right now, some of us were Noah, we feel like an absolute failure. Noah preached 100 years. How many people did he convert? Seven people. 100 years? Seven people? Who were those seven people? All his family. Not one person after 100 years of preaching. And the Bible called him a preacher of righteousness. He said, well, obviously he wasn't a good preacher, was he? <laughs> you know why? Our emphasis is on the conversion of souls and not on pleasing him. So therefore, if we don't see the fruit of these things, we feel like failures. Hallelujah. All you got to be concerned about is pleasing him. You say, well, don't say things like that because then people don't want to go out and win souls. No, no, no. If you please him, you will do what he says. You will do it, and you will do it with joy. Everybody say, with joy. Now look at Hosea chapter 1. I want you to see this because <laughs> verse 2, the beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms. <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Some of us right now, we're trying to get out of marriages because we don't like what's happening. You will now, you want me to go marry someone who I already know is not going to be faithful to me? By the way, why am I doing this, God? My people. Why do I have to have my heart broken? My people. Listen to them. I'm going to read it again. Hosea chapter 1, verse 2. Beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said, everybody say the Lord said. The Lord said to Hosea, go take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and children of whoredoms. For the land hath committed great whoredom, departing from the Lord. So he went and took Gomer. Gomer bears him a son. Hmm. Why am I doing this? Because the people have committed whoredom. They don't serve me anymore. They've gone whoring after other gods. If I'm going to take you... I'm going to let your heart get broken so you understand how my heart feels. Some of you don't understand. You're not getting it. Because God wants you to be like him and that's the greatest reward he can give you, sometimes he lets you.
go through things for years because he for years has been waiting. Why are you doing this? My people. You're doing this for my people. That's why you're doing it, my people. What am I getting out of this? The joy of knowing that you serve me. <laughs> now look at this. Chapter 3 of Hosea. Chapter 3, Hosea. Then said the Lord unto me, Go, yet love a woman beloved of her friends, yet an adulteress, according to the love of the Lord toward the children of Israel, who look to other gods and love flagons of wine. So, listen, so I bought her to me for 15 pieces of silk. I don't know if you're getting this, but what he's really trying to say is go back. Gomer had left him. He did, she did just exactly what Israel did. God went and got Israel, brought her unto himself, married Israel. Israel then goes back out and leaves God and whores after somebody else. That's what happened here. She, he gets Gomer, he marries Gomer, Gomer bears him children, then goes and leaves him and gets in another man's bed. You know what God said? Go and buy her back. No, no, don't go get her because you see what happened is she's gotten him so deep that she's now in slavery. You will have to pay for her. You want me to pay for somebody that hurt and broke my heart? It, now, it's bad enough to try to tell me to go back and get them, but now you want me to reach in my pocket, too? Oh, my mama didn't raise no fools. My name is Bennett, and I ain't in it. The prophet reached in his purse, walked towards God, his wife, and paid for her as the Lord said <sighs> now there's a whole lot more to go through with the prophets but I'm stopping right there because I just want to get across to you I want to get across to you by the Spirit of the Lord and a lot of stuff you think you're even going through honey don't even come close to what God could really be asking of you and expect it with joy because the things that God has asked for people, the things that God has asked from them, and they did it with joy. Do you understand? Do you understand they didn't have a full Bible? Do you understand they didn't have a congregation of the righteous around them? Do you understand that they didn't have what we have? They didn't have an assembly of the righteous like this. They didn't have, amen, Holy Ghost filled believers around them. They didn't have people that could strengthen their hands. Who is Jeremiah going to turn to to get a prophetic word? Who is going to encourage this man of God? Who is going to encourage these people of God? I tell you what was going to be done. They were going to walk into the presence of the Lord and say, I love you. I don't even know why you want me to do all of this. But I love you and I will obey you. I will do exactly what you desire me to do. Because my joy is to do your will. I live and I breathe just to perform thy will. It is not for my pleasure that I am alive. It is not for my goodness. Ah, if I could only get some of y'all to understand that in this house. Because some of you feel so depressed because you can't get what you want because you can't get married because you can't have children because you can't get the better job because you can't get the nicer things now all of a sudden you're deprived and it's so unfair God said hold on here who is the Lord and who is the servant where is your joy God said, I shall raise up a people, and they shall praise me. They will do my bidding. And when I call them to the assembly of the righteous, they will come to my services. They will open up their mouth. They will give me glory. Oh, God. Oh, God. The Lord spoke to me a few days ago. He told me I couldn't tell it, but he's telling me I can tell it now. He woke me up and he said to me, Son, where is the hunger in Battersea? I said, What are you saying, God? He wouldn't finish it. Then he just left me with that. And I watched over the days of the singles conference while God was moving. And a good portion of this church was never here. It was mostly outside people that came and filled a lot of this thing up. 
And God said, oh no, they don't not getting it, but I'm going to cause them to get it. For I shall arise in the midst, and I shall begin to pick, saith the Lord, in accordance to the hearts of worshipers, those that will turn their face to me, and those that will come when the service and the doors of the Lord are open. They shall come in. They shall lift their heads. They shall bring their money. They shall bring their praise, and they will do that which I desire them to do. They will not go by their convenience. They will not go by their tiredness. They will do as they are commanded. And they're not going to whine about it. Listen to the Apostle Paul. I've suffered the loss of all things. What have you lost? What have you lost? I've suffered the loss of all things that I might win. Not a soul. That I might win. I want to win Christ. That's why I'm going through all this. Why are you going through all this? Why are you crying? Why are you pressing your way? I want him. I need him. He means more to me than life itself. There's no other reason to live. You don't understand. The only reason why I live is for his approval. I've gone back. I've gone back even after these services, and I've seen some of the spirits that sit upon the people in this congregation, and they drove me back into my room until I started crying, and I told God with a seriousness, if I ever act that way to you, take me home. Don't you ever let me sit like that. Don't you ever let me sit like that and not give you praise. Take me home. You live to give him glory. You live to give him praise. You don't live to get a new car. You don't live to get a new outfit. You don't live to get a spouse. You live for God. In him you live. You move. And some of you are so opinionated. And you don't even understand that it's God that gives you the breath to express the opinion. And it's God that lets your mind have sanity to even have an opinion. If you don't know it, it's time for you to find an altar. Make an altar wherever you are. If you want to come to the front, come to the front wherever you want to kneel, however you want to stand. If you want to walk, friend, it's up to you. But make an altar. Make an altar wherever you are. It's time to seek God. Oh, God, let me be obedient to you. Let me obey you with joy. Give me for all this whining and complaining. Thank you, my brothers. We don't need music right now. Thank you. We're going to seek the face of God. There's a spirit of repentance in this house. Oh, God. Oh, God. Let me obey you with joy. Let me obey you. 